Okay, so today we are gonna talk about attitudes. And I'm not talking about the good attitude of like everything is great and it's perfect. I'm talking about like the bad attitude, the negative attitude, the complaining attitude, the one that whenever you're with this person, you're just like, come on, it can't be that bad. Anybody have that friend? Is anybody that friend? Yes. Oh. The whole congregation goes, oh. <laughs> well. <laughs> so honest moment. I am going to just kind of like bare my soul to you right now and tell you something that for a very long time I struggled with in my attitude and complaining. So from the ages of 16 to 27, I was a waitress. And I was a really good waitress. And I say that because my brain automatically like processes and thinks like two or three steps ahead. Like if you're telling me something, um, like a plan that you have or a dream that you have, or I'm just thinking about something, I'm automatically thinking, how can I Google this? What can we do to prepare for this? What's the next step? I don't even know. And so whenever you're a waitress, that's a really good trait to have. It's really great because I see my table and I'm automatically thinking two or three steps ahead of what do they need, how can I get it for them, I need to go get drinks for this table, go run and print this table's check, and I'm gonna grab some butter and ketchup for you on the way back. Like, I'm thinking about the whole process. But when you are being waited on by someone who does not think like that, um, it is not the best experience. And it's not the easiest to sit there and just think about all of the things and see all of the things that's not happening to make my dining experience as good as it should be. Okay? It was just until recently, in the last couple years, that I could actually go out to eat and like peacefully sit there and have a meal. Because before, I was constantly judging and I was complaining about my waiter. And you can ask Pastor Clarissa because she dealt with it. Look at her. She's like, yep. <laughs> the, I wouldn't like complain to the manager, but I would like complain a lot to the people at my table. Like they heard about it. So I just want to tell you a couple of things that I used to complain about and that would irk me to no end. So if you were ever my waiter or waitress, I'm sorry. Okay, um, number one, if I am done with my food, why have you not asked me about dessert and printed my ticket so that I have the option to either stay or go? Like that option is before me, I get to choose. Okay, <laughs> because if I'm done, this is past Janelle, okay, just realize as I say these things, <laughs> if I am done and I have to wait on you, and I see you over there talking to your coworkers. I'm not happy. I am not happy. I understand restaurants get busy. I understand waiters and waitresses go in the weeds. If you've never worked in a restaurant, going into the weeds means I am over my head drowning. I cannot get caught up. Please, somebody help me. I understand that that happens. But if I have to wait on you, dear Lord, thank you for working on my patience. <laughs> Number two. My plate is empty. Why is it still in front of me? Okay, better yet, why at the end of the meal are my appetizer plates and little pieces of trash still on my table? Okay, clean it off. <laughs> and number three, I'm so glad Jesus walks with us and heals us. <laughs> number three, and this is the one that still sometimes I have to like tame my facial expressions. I still have to work on this one uh, because if I wanted lemon with my first glass of water and you have refilled my cup three times, do you not think I want lemon with my third cup of water? <laughs> like, I, I don't understand. <laughs> Praise the Lord <laughs> that he has been so gracious to me <laughs> and that he has convicted me of my attitude. Because the truth is, like, I couldn't go out to eat for years and enjoy that experience. I couldn't go out to eat and, like, enjoy time with my friends and the fun conversations that happen at the table and the serious conversations and the laughter and the jokes because I was constantly looking at everything that was wrong. I was constantly seeing what wasn't happening instead of looking at what is in front of me and appreciating that. 
And so that stopped me from enjoying a lot. And then also, dear Lord, please forgive me, friends, if you have ever went out to eat with me before the conviction fell. Because not only did they have to sit and listen to me grumble and complain, but they saw They saw how I treated someone behind their back. And that like really gets me. They saw how I gossiped about somebody. And that's not my heart. And that's not who I want to be. But somehow, some way, sometimes that's just who we are. And we have to really ask Jesus for the things that are in our hearts that need to be changed. We really have to ask Jesus, God, I'm seeing something wrong and I don't know what it is. And like, can you convict me? Can you change me? Can you? And he does. I would really hate for someone, for my friends who I say that I love, be scared to talk about their personal issues in front of me because they're scared that I'm gonna go and gossip behind their backs. But let's take this a little deeper because that was something personally that I had to work on, but there's some other things that I think a lot of us have to work on, or maybe like we're walking through and um, like we complain about God in our lives. We complain about Jesus. We complain about the seasons that we're in and how I don't like this and why did you do this to me? And, <clears throat> and if, if gossiping and complaining about a person feels ugly and looks ugly, like how detrimental is it to our spirit and to our relationship with Jesus when we complain about him? And so I just wanna take a couple different people within the Bible and I just, I wanna take like this deeper look of what a life of complaining does to us, how the posture of our attitude, it can affect us. And that when we turn and from our complaining attitude and we turn and we lean in and we trust the Lord, even in circumstances that we don't understand, what that could actually look like. Because it can be a really beautiful thing that can happen in our lives. So first, let's look at Israel, okay? When the, people were Israel, when the people of Israel were in the process of becoming what God had created them to be, it was a rough road. Anybody else experience a rough road whenever you come to Jesus and you're like, oh my gosh, this is so hard. Like for three years after I came to know Jesus, I would tell him, this is the hardest thing I've ever done, Lord. Listen, I used to be a drug addict, and be homeless, and coming to Jesus was one of the hardest things I ever did. Because living a life of sin and being comfortable in what I know was so much easier than breaking the chains of bondage on my life and living pure and righteous before the Lord. But you know what, church? We gotta step out, we gotta do it, we gotta fight for ourselves, fight for our relationship with Jesus, because he is worth it. Fight to stand holy and pure before the Lord. So first look, Israel, their rough road. They'd been in slavery for 400 years and the Lord was done with it. And God, he spoke to this man named Moses. He had, Moses had been raised in Egypt in Pharaoh's house and then he murdered someone. He ran away and now he's been in the desert for 40 years and he's built this new life for himself. He's married, he has children, he has livestock, like this whole life for himself he has built. And then God comes to him all of a sudden in a burning bush, which you all know, I think that's so strange that God would speak through a burning bush, but whatever, God can choose to speak to whomever, whomever however he wants to. But, so God speaks to him and basically he says, and this is paraphrased in Janelle's language, okay? He says, Moses, listen, I know you killed someone and then you ran away and you've done a great job of putting your past behind you. But this is what I need you to do. You're gonna go back to Egypt and you're gonna stand before Pharaoh and you're gonna tell him to let the Israelites go. Who here would be excited about that? Like, I would not be excited. <laughs> I think I'd be like, no, if that's the plan, I don't want it. No, like, I'm not doing that. If that's the plan, don't even look at me. And yet, out of much convincing, out of God saying why, and Moses being like, I have a speech impediment, I can't speak, okay, let me help you with that. I'm gonna give you a helper, your brother Aaron. Out of all of this back and forth, back and forth, and we know this happens in our own relationship with Jesus. He tells us to do something. No, I don't want to. Okay, no, I don't want to. Well, okay, fine, I'll do it. 
He has this helper, Aaron, his brother, and then they go back into Egypt. And as they walk back into Egypt, Moses goes before Pharaoh and he tells them, God has said to let my people go. I mean, God himself said that. And of course, Pharaoh said no. And the Bible scholars think that from the time that Moses and Aaron entered Egypt to the time that the Israelites exited Egypt, it was a t period of like 40 days. And so within that 40 days, there is um, Moses going, Moses and Aaron going and saying, you know, let my people go, blah, 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 blah. Here's this, God says this. And Pharaoh's being wishy-washy and he's just saying like, okay, go, no, you're not allowed to go. Go, no, you're not allowed to go. And Pharaoh, in all of his wishy-washiness, he refuses to open his heart to what God is doing. And so um, I just want to point out that then over that 40-day time period, God shows up in miracle after miracle after miracle after miracle in the lives of the Israelites. Miracles happen over this 40-day span. One, 10 of which are 10 plagues. There's the water that turned it into blood. That would have been my first thing of like, get out. <laughs> but no, <laughs> frogs, gnats, flies. You still ain't gonna release the people, Pharaoh? Okay, let's go on. What about all of your livestock dead? No, you're still not gonna do it? Okay, boils. Y'all get boils all over your body. Like, seriously. And I'm not talking about like, you can go into your house and shut your door and the frogs are outside. Like they're jumping around inside your house. Gnats are inside your bed. The, ooh, like that just, like just, flies are just beating at you. Like all of Jim, uh, your livestock is dead and then boils all over your body. Then hail rains down from the heavens and Pharaoh, he's still not ready. He still will not let God's people go. He still will not open his heart to what God is doing. You know, the first five times, the first five plagues, the Bible says that Pharaoh hardened his own heart. And then the last five plagues, it says, all right, God hardened his heart. That right there. You wanna continue hardening your heart to what Jesus is doing in your life? Plague number eight, locust. Plague number nine, darkness. And plague number 10. This is the one that really affected Pharaoh because this plague, this plague is where the Jews get the holiday called the Passover. Maybe you've heard of it. Okay, in Israel, they had to prepare for it. They had to take a lamb, a goat, a sheep. They had to sacrifice it, put some blood over the doorpost of their house. But it, and if there wasn't any blood, then the firstborn male in the home, human or, or animal, they were put to death. The sacrifice had to be made and God would go through, he went through that night and if that blood was there, oh, he looked at that and said, those are my people. And if that blood wasn't there, then the firstborn male was taken. A sacrifice had to be made to cover the Israelites to protect them. Rewind to the Garden of Eden whenever sin entered the world. Have you ever noticed that God sacrificed an animal to cover the sins of Adam and Eve? Fast forward to Jesus. A perfect sacrifice had to be made. That's why Jesus died on a cross and rose from the dead so that our sins could be covered and we could stand before God. And now Jews, they still celebrate this holiday called Passover. And this plague, it affected Pharaoh, and this is what made him relent, because all of his firstborn was killed. I can just see Moses. Pharaoh relents, and all of a sudden, Moses and Aaron are like, let's go, let's go, get out of Israel. And the Israelites are taking all their stuff, and they're getting out of Israel, or getting out of Egypt as fast as he could, as fast as they could. And in God, in all of his mercy, he didn't just say, all right, you're out, I'm done with you. I'm done, go, go, have fun. Enjoy the desert. Listen, Egyptian deserts are not nice, okay? <laughs> they are hot. They are really hot. <laughs> there is nothing there. But God, in so much mercy, he continues to perform miracle after miracle after miracle in the lives of the Israelites. In Exodus 13, 21, it says, by day the Lord went ahead of them in a pillar of cloud to guide them on their way. 
And that cloud was to not only guide them, but to cover them from the Egyptian sun. And by night, and a pillar of fire to give them light so that they could travel by day or night. And this is where the story gets really good. Like, I know that we know this story. Like, if you've been in church for a while, you know this story. You know that they're in the desert and Pharaoh has relented and, and they're free. And then all of a sudden, Pharaoh says, no way, I cannot believe those Israelites. Army, round up. We are going out. And all of the Egyptian army starts coming after the Israelites. And they're coming at them. And I can just imagine how the Israelites feel because, I mean, there's a lot of Israelites, but there's a lot of the Egyptian army also. So, and they see them coming and dust, sand is just going up in the air and they see this cloud and all of a sudden they get, they think they're about to get away and they come to the Red Sea and there's nowhere to go and they turn around, but the Egyptian army's coming, but the Red Sea is here and God has mercy again and again and again. Again and again and again, Exodus 14, 19 through 20 says, the angel of God who had been traveling in front of the Israel, Israel army, he withdrew and he went behind them. And the pillar of cloud also moved from the, from the back to the front. He stood behind them, coming between the armies of Egypt and Israel. Throughout the night, the cloud brought darkness to the one side and light to the other side. So neither went near the other all night long. And God can do that for us also. Sometimes we run and we run and we run from our past and we think, we hope and we pray that we don't have to deal with it anymore. And the reality, the truth is that God in leading us can also stand between us, between our past and he can be that barrier so that it cannot get to us. And yet for some reason, so many times we reach back for our past and we pull it in the present. We reach back and we pull it into the present. And God is saying, I'm standing between you and your past. Do you not see it? Can you not lean into the strength and, and the power and my presence right now so that this, this doesn't happen anymore? But you can stand and look forward and move forward in what Jesus has for you. And then... Another miracle. The Lord parts the Red Sea and the Israelites were able to walk through on dry ground. Every single Israelite made it to the other side. And when the Egyptian army was walking through also, the Lord closed the sea and they were swept away. God performed miracle after miracle in the lives of the Israelites. He showed up for them in ways I can't even imagine. And you know what those no good punk kid from the Project Israelites did. <laughs> For those that are first time guests, <laughs> our pastor is a punk kid from the projects. <laughs> yeah, put the hat on backwards. <laughs> he is a punk kid from the project that got saved radically by Jesus. But those Israelites, they just complained and complained and they complained over and over again because things were not how they wanted them to be. They complained that the food wasn't good enough. They complained about water. That sounds like my dining experience. <laughs> they complained about the desert. Instead of seeing all the miracles that God was doing, they positioned their attitudes as to what they were going through was unfair instead of seeing how God was saving them. And they longed, the Bible says, they longed to return to Egypt, to slavery. Instead of seeing Jesus move in our own lives, let me ask that question, do we do the same thing? Do we Instead of seeing Jesus move in our own lives, do we stand in seasons that we feel are unfair and we long for the past? Do we long for things that might have felt familiar, even though, because familiar, familiar like provides a sense of security, right? Even if it's not real. Sometimes we live with the posture of our attitude as God was faithful back then, but here, like, I don't know. Is he being faithful right now? 
because I'm not seeing miracles and I'm not feeling his presence. And you know, like things aren't happening like they did like over here in this season. But then I'm on this journey with Jesus. And so obviously I'm gonna, I'm gonna move on the journey. But here, like, is he really faithful here? Because I felt you back there. Can I just go back here? Even though sometimes here, I couldn't wait to get out of here. And yet, here I don't feel God's presence, but that was familiar even though it was harmful sometimes. But I long to go back there. And I was reading through uh, Psalm 106 and there are a couple things that stood out to me because in truth, like the Israelites, they were only supposed to be in the desert for one year, just one year. And instead, because of their complaining and grumbling, they stayed 40 years in the desert. And those that had been taken out of Egypt, that generation, because of their complaining and grumbling and lack of trust in God and what he was doing for them, did not enter the promised land that God had for them. So Psalm 106, there's three things that stood out to me that um, the Israelites did to keep them wandering around the desert for 40 years. But I wonder how many of us, before we go forward, I wonder how many of us are sitting in this room and they feel like, you feel like you're wandering through a desert. And you don't see a way out. Maybe you're longing for past. Maybe you're longing to go back to things that felt familiar even though they weren't safe. And I just want to encourage you to not live by what you see and feel because our senses can lie to us. But I want you to live by the truth of who Jesus is because if we go by our truth, it's very easy to do these next three things. But if we go by the truth of the word of God and who Jesus is, then we're always gonna be walking on that journey with Jesus, okay? So the first thing they did is they forgot. Psalm 106, 13 says, and I feel like this is something that all of us could say for ourselves, but they soon forgot what he had done and did not wait for his plan to unfold. Verse 14 says, but they became lustfully greedy in the wilderness and they put God to the test in the desert. The truth is the lives of the Israelites were saved not just saved, but they were miraculously saved over and over and over. And they started to complain about what God was doing. It wasn't enough. You're not providing for me enough. You're not doing what I want you to do. They entered seasons of need, a time that was uncomfortable, a place where they really didn't want to be. And instead of turning to the Lord and asking for help, they complained. I mean, if he helped them before, why wouldn't they turn to him now and ask for help? They didn't even have, even have to ask for help before. And yet they didn't even think to turn to the Lord and say, oh, what is going on? Can you help me? Instead of asking for clarification, because a lot of times I just need the Lord to clarify what's going on. Instead of asking for clarification, they complained. Instead of reminding God that he had provided for them, because sometimes I need to know that, God, I need to remind you. Remember, you said this. Remember, you did this. Like I, Not because he needs to be reminded, because I need to remind him. <laughs> Instead of reminding God that he had provided for them to be free from 400 years of slavery, and now they needed help, they complained to the point that the Israelites forgot how bad Egypt was. That they literally said to Moses, why did you bring us out into this desert to die? We should go back to Egypt. You know, it took one day, one day to get the Israelites out of Egypt. Once Pharaoh said, you can go, one day to get them out. And it took 40 years to get Egypt out of the Israelites. One day. So don't be surprised when you come out of a situation and it still feels like a struggle. 
Don't be surprised when you are fighting for healing and yet you think that healing takes too long. You keep fighting for yourself. You keep fighting for healing. You keep fighting for God's will in your life. You keep fighting to get whatever that sin or that stronghold or that slavery or that Egypt out of you. It's not going to take one day. It's gonna take a really long time. And there's gonna be times in your life that you say, is this even working? I don't even want to do this. This isn't even worth it. It is worth it. Don't be surprised. (laughs) Don't be surprised that when you come out of a life of sin, if sometimes you still struggle in that sin, it takes time to break the sin of bondage off of our lives. Don't be surprised when you still react the same way that you did in the past. And all of a sudden, that person that you have tried so hard not to be makes an appearance out of the blue. Because you might have like given your heart to Jesus in one day, but that past takes a while to come out of you. Freedom, healing, and becoming a new person takes time. It takes work and effort on our part and trust that Jesus is gonna do his part. We walk hand in hand. We walk with Jesus through that. And it's in those times whenever we fight and struggle in our own strength, in our own power, in our own ways, we don't lean into who the person of Jesus is for his strength, his power. It's in those times that we take a look back and we try and pull that past forward. Don't be like the Israelites. And as God is taking your hand and he's leading you forward, you dig your heels in and he's trying to pull, come on, come forward. And you just dig your heels in. No, I'm not going forward. I'm not going forward until you give me what I want, God. Refusing to move forward instead, we look back and think how much better the past was. I'm not going forward, Jesus. And he so graciously wants to take our hands and lead us into the call of God on our lives and into being, becoming the person that God created you to be. How many are digging their heels in today, refusing to move forward because you don't like the situation that you're living in? because you don't like the healing that hasn't come, because you don't like the person that you still are, because you don't, that doesn't mean that we stop, that just means we keep moving forward with Jesus. And in the depths of their forgetting and untrusting God in the process, they create a golden idol and worship it instead of God. The second point, they worshiped, which you would think that this would be a good point, like they worshiped but it's not. Psalm 106, 19 says, the people made a calf at Mount Sinai. They bowed down to an image made of gold. Verse 20, they exchanged the glory of God for the image of an ox that eats grass. Verse 21, they forgot the God who saved them, who had done great things in Egypt. Verse 22, the the miracles in the land of Ham and awesome deeds by the Red Sea. We have to be careful not to think that just because Jesus isn't providing for us the way that we want him to, that there is something better than what Jesus has for us in this season. Because when we start thinking that way, we are susceptible to start worshiping things that are not God himself. You see, the reason that they brought all of their gold together and they melted it down and then they formed it into a cow and then they bowed down in worship to this image that they created with their own hands was because God was taking too long. I feel like a lot of us can feel the same way if we're not careful. A lot of us can start to think, God, you're taking too long in giving me what I think that I need or what I deserve or what I desire or even, God, what you created me for. 
I've said that to the Lord myself. You created me for this. What's taking so long? Where's all my impatient people at? Yes, I know. And I don't know today if you yourself have melted down gold and formed it into a calf to worship. But I know some of us like to worship our own will instead of God's will. Some of us like to worship our own desires or the idol of social media or money or the idol of someone else's presence. And whenever all of this takes place, it's just this natural progression, complaining, grumbling, forgetting, worshiping of idols, then you start to despise. Psalm 106, 24 says, the people refused to enter the pleasant land for they wouldn't believe his promises to care for them. Instead, they grumbled and in their tents, they refused to obey the Lord. Another translation says that uh, instead they grumbled in their tents and despised the Lord. Let me explain this a bit. Because the Israelites walked through the desert for about a year complaining and grumbling and worshiping idols, wishing they could go back to Egypt, back to slavery, but God had a different plan for them. Yeah, that was just a year of hard times, a year of getting their past out of them so that they could see the future that God had for them. God had a plan. He actually had a whole land, a whole country for them. And the Bible calls it the promised land. And it was a land flowing with milk and honey and it had fruit that was huge and and it was built up with houses and cities and it was just this amazing place for them. And then they get to the cusp of the promised land and because they didn't work out throughout that last year to get slavery in Egypt out of them, they didn't trust God for the future that he had for them. Because the process of God trying to get Egypt out of the hearts of the Israelites, they just kept fighting. It was a back and forth, back and forth because it didn't look like how it should have looked like. When they did come to the place that God had for them, they refused to walk in his promises. They had not gone through the process of healing from their past situations. And as a result, they didn't trust God for their future. Complaining and grumbling will not develop character. It doesn't develop perseverance. It doesn't develop communication skills. It doesn't develop patience. It doesn't develop trust and becoming the person that God needs you to be so that he can like propel you into the promises and plan that he has for you. But what it does do is keep us stuck stuck right where we are. Don't raise your hand, but do you feel stuck? I'm just stuck right here and I don't know how to get out of it and I don't know which way to go and nothing looks right. I don't understand it. I just wanna encourage you to keep going. If you're in a season of complaining and grumbling, take that to Jesus walk through a level of healing or processes or whatever you need to do because God has a plan that he wrote out for you before creation was ever created. It is not one that you are stuck. It is not one that you grumble and complain and sit at the table with other people and gossip and lie. It's not one that you can't be released from your sin. The plan is not that you're gonna struggle your whole entire life with something, but he has freedom written out for you. I have just a couple thoughts before we transition to the next part because there's many scriptures in the Bible that talk about God being like the affection of our praises and that we praise him. And whenever we praise him for who he is, like we can put him as um, the rightful place for who he is as King of Kings and Lord of Lords. That let me just say that that does not mean that our attitude or a lack of praise or our praise in any way changes who God is overall. But what it does is changes our point of view of who God is. 
And so let me ask this question. If we glorify God with our praises, who do we glorify with our complaining? Who was I glorifying whenever I was talking bad about the waitress to my friends? There's another scripture that says, I enter his presence with praise. Whose presence do I enter when I complain in an unhealthy way? In no way am I saying that we cannot complain to God or bring our troubles to him, but there is a wrong way and a right way to complain to Jesus. And so real quick, as we're closing up, Angel, if you could come up. I just want to lay this foundation with one of my favorite books of the Bible. Habakkuk is one of my favorite books. I love like the old uh, minor prophets. They are just, you really gotta have a commentary if you're gonna read them, okay? Because they're very confusing. <laughs> but I need those old Bible scholars to like tell me how to read it. But whatever, I break it apart. It's just so beautiful. It's just one of the best books because it shows like a nitty gritty real conversation with God and what that can look like. One to where we're pouring our heart out to the Lord, complaining and asking him questions of why, how could this happen? Do you not see this? Let's just go through it real quick. Habakkuk 1, 2 says, how long, O Lord? How many have asked that question to Jesus? How long? How long must I call for help, but you don't listen? How many times do I gotta cry violence? but you don't save. Why do you make me look at injustice? Why do you tolerate wrongdoing? Right there, like that's real. That's a real conversation, real complaining to the Lord. I know I have said those things to the Lord. Like, are you seriously not listening to me? Do you not hear what I'm saying, Jesus? Why are you allowing this to happen in my life? I don't want this to happen in my life. I thought my life would be different and yet this is the plan you have for me. And I love how the Lord answers Habakkuk because he doesn't, um, I don't even know the word, maybe he doesn't like soothe him like, oh, you're so right, I'm sorry. But what he does say basically is like, yeah, those people are horrible. Yeah, they're horrible and they do horrible things. You're right, Habakkuk, yep, I see it. God doesn't stop horrible things from happening. That's not the God that we serve. But he knows that they're happening and he's here to walk through us, walk through it with us to be strength and to be peace and to bring knowledge and wisdom and understanding in situations that we don't understand because we don't get three wishes and life just turns out to be amazing. Then Habakkuk answers in a way, this next part is very important. Habakkuk answers in a way that appeals to the nature of God. First, he lays his complaint to the Lord and then he appeals to the nature of God. Habakkuk 1, 12 through 13, he's like, God, oh Lord, are you not from everlasting? My God, my Holy One, you are the one that's never going to die. Lord, you've you, you appointed these people to execute judgment, you? You, my rock, you've ordained them to punish, you? Oh, your eyes are too pure to look on evil. You can't tolerate wrongdoing. Basically, what are you doing? You can't tolerate this. Why are you silent while the wicked swallow up those more righteous than themselves. He lays his complaint before the Lord and then he draws on the nature of who God is. And Habakkuk's next response to his own complaint is one that changed my view of God and the way that I talk to him, the way that I complain, the way that I pour out my heart to him. I have quoted this scripture over and over and over again to the Lord. Because there's all these things that are still going on. 
all the injustice, all the treacherous things that are happening, the violence, all of this is going on. And he lays that complaint before the Lord and he says, God, oh, why is that really who you are? But then in Habakkuk 2, 1, he's like, I'm gonna stand on my watch and I'm gonna station myself on the rampart. Rampart is just a wall that surrounds a city. He says, and I'll look to see what he will say to me and what answer I am to give to this complaint. And basically what Habakkuk is saying is, God, I've given you it all and I've, rem- I've done all the necessary things that I need to do. I've complained, I've reminded you, I've reminded myself. Now I'm gonna wait for your response. I'm gonna wait for either you to correct my faulty thinking or I w- I'm gonna wait for you to explain to me what in the world is going on because this doesn't make sense. Because what I'm seeing, what I'm experiencing, what I'm hearing, it doesn't make sense. And so, you know what, I'm gonna, I'm gonna stand on this watch and I'm gonna wait for the Lord's response because what I'm experiencing, what I'm feeling, this isn't right. So God, you have to speak to me. God, you are a good God. You are the one who can't look at injustice. You are the one that never dies. You are the one who gives salvation. It's you, God, you. But for some reason, all of this is happening and I would, I would act differently, Jesus, if I was you. But for some reason, you're acting and, and not responding the way that I would like for you to respond. And so God, I'm just gonna stand here and I'm gonna wait for you to correct my faulty thinking or change the way that I see things or God, just help me understand. Do you see what's happening here? There's this back and forth with God and Habakkuk. There's a real conversation happening. There's a healthy conversation happening. It's not like with the Israelites who point their finger, why did you bring me out into this desert? I wanna go back to Egypt. I wanna go back to my slavery. Cause at least there was meat back there. They completely forgot about the, the beatings and the backbreaking work and the hours and the hours and the hours and the years that they were property of. Let me go back. Because you did this to me. You brought me to this place. And we don't see that here with Habakkuk. We see a back and forth relationship of laying complaints and building trust and listening to the Lord. And God, I don't understand it, but I'm gonna wait for your response. Because at the end of Habakkuk, the truth is, there isn't a solution. And I, I, I don't know how much complaining I can do to the Lord and that there's gonna be a solution to the world's problems. The truth is the wrong people are still wrong and the bad people are still bad and God didn't wave this magic wand and set all things right or change Habakkuk's life. That's not who God is. We have to understand and live in the truth that Jesus isn't with us in blocks of time providing there and then, but not here and now. He doesn't remember us here and forget about us here. He isn't here to fix everything in our lives and to make it right. But what he is, he is present in every season, in every situation, in every second of every minute of every single day. He is with us. And in his presence is everything that I need and so much more than what I deserve. Because the truth is there's some seasons that Jesus shows up and he shows out and it feels so amazing. Like there's so much good and there's so many miracles happening. And then all of a sudden we get gut punched by the world and life and we can't breathe and nothing is going right. The hard seasons do not change who Jesus is. But it does mean that in those hard seasons, And in the seasons where we feel like he's amazing and the seasons where we, I don't really understand what's going on, Jesus. We have the option to either point our finger at him or lean in and rest in him. And then we can say, just like Habakkuk did at the end, Habakkuk 3, 17 through 19, he says, 
Though the fig tree does not bud and there's no grapes on the vine, though the olive crops fell and the fields produce no food, though there's no sheep in the pen and no cattle in the stalls, and none of that makes sense to our life, our culture today really. But what it's saying is, even if I have no good in my life right now, and it seems like everything is chaos, and I have horrible doctor's reports, and my kids are driving me crazy, and my marriage is in shambles, and I can't get away from sin that so easily entangles me. God, I'm trying. And even though none of those things are happening in my life, and everything feels like it's gonna fall apart, verse 18, yet I will rejoice in the Lord, and I will be joyful in my God, my Savior. The sovereign Lord is my strength. You know, that's where, this is where we have to get, this is where we have to get to in our relationship with Jesus. This is where, because if we don't, if we stay in a place of, you know, well, Jesus was faithful then, but he's not faithful now and pointing fingers. And maybe one day in the future, when I move on on this journey, he's gonna start being faithful again. Listen, we'll never become who God created us to be. We will never walk <coughs> into the promises of God for our lives. But what we will be, our complainers, we'll be forgetting what God has done for us. We will despise where we are instead of seeing the hand of Jesus lead us into the promised land. I don't know about you, but I want what Jesus has for me. I think all of us in here could say, hopefully all of us in here could say, I want what Jesus has for me. And there might be some of us in here that could say, but I'm not living that way. Church, let's choose to be people that decides that whatever Jesus wants, that's what we want. Even if it doesn't feel good in that moment. Let's pray. You know, this is the time at the end whenever usually we put a lot of fluffy words into this part. But I'm not gonna put any fluffy words. Who here feels like they're in a desert wandering around aimlessly? Anybody here feel that? Would you raise your hand and say, that's me? Yeah, I see it, I see it. You're in a desert wandering around. You don't know how to get out of it. And in the depths of your heart, you're asking Jesus if, his, if he's really involved or if he really even cares. Jesus, you see these hands, but more importantly, you see their hearts and you see their complaints and, and their fears. And God, I'm just gonna ask this simple request. God, will you revive hope and trust in these situations, in these lives? and these thoughts and these fears and the situations and, and everything that is involved with that hand raised, God, would you just revive hope and trust? Lord, would you revive a relationship with you? Lord, would you revive, would you change the way that our eyes see things? Would you change the way that our hearts are experiencing this season? God, would you align our lives and our hearts and our minds and our thoughts, God, with who you are and what you have today? And maybe there's some people here and like you don't have a relationship with Jesus and you're hearing about this Jesus and he's one that walks with you, what? That's possible? When I was writing this, I just felt like there are people here that are gonna say like, no, I have to get my life straight before I come to Jesus. There's things in my life I have to clean up before I come to Jesus. I can't come before Jesus with these struggles, with this sin in my life. Church, let me just tell you, that's not the Jesus that we serve. That is not the God, that's not the way that this works. Our God is not the one that says, clean yourself up and then come to me. He says, come to me dirty, 
Come to me, everything that you have, all of your burdens, everything, I want you to bring it to me. You know what, better yet, I'm gonna come to you and I'm gonna pick those up for you. That's the Jesus that we serve. And if you're here today and you are ready to give that Jesus a try, because maybe you heard about this other Jesus. <laughs> maybe you've experienced things with the church in the past and that's been a lie. Maybe you have, have heard lies about who this God is, but now you're hearing about this one that will come to me, that will clean me up, that will revive my life, that I can be who he created me. And you wanna give that Jesus a try. Maybe you wanna come back to him or it's the first time you've come to him. If that's you, I just want you to raise your hand because I wanna know who we're praying with. Is there anybody here? I see you. I see you in the back. Is there anybody else that you wanna give this life with Jesus a try? Let's all pray this prayer. Jesus, Lord, thank you. Thank you for who you are, who you've always been and who you will always be. Lord, I come to you with this heart and I just lay it before you. And God, I just thank you, Jesus. I thank you that you died on a cross, that you saved me, that you are saving me, Jesus. Lord, would you help me live for you? Lord, and when I mess up and when I wanna go back, wanna go back to things that seem familiar just because they're comfortable. Lord, let me continue to walk with you. And I thank you, Lord, for who you are. Thank you for revealing yourself to me. Thank you for changing my heart my life and my mind. God, help me walk in that. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen, church. Amen. Let's all stand. As we close, I just wanna pray a blessing over you. Can we all just raise our hands, Jesus? Lord, I pray for this congregation. I thank you, Lord, for every single person that's here. Lord, I ask for blessings that abound in ways they never thought possible. Lord, I ask that your presence would be tangible in ways that they have never experienced before. I pray that your voice is the loudest voice that they've ever heard in their depths of their soul, Jesus. Lord, I pray that prayers would be answered, God. I pray that lives would be changed. I pray, God, that hearts, hardened hearts that have chosen to harden themselves to you, Jesus, would be softened today. Lord, I pray blessings abounding in their lives. In the name of Jesus, amen. Amen. Amen, church. Well, I love you guys. And I'll see you this week.